Hi, I'm Paul Kasabian, I'm a structural engineer, and this is a piece of paper again. And what we know about paper that is when it's flat, it doesn't do well in compression, but it does do well in tension, right? So if we put the two together on a piece of paper I drew on earlier, and we have blue representing compression, red's going to represent tension. I'm going to hold the piece of paper at one end only, it's what we call a cantilever. And then I'm going to put a force down at the other end using this other hat, right? And when I do that, this happens, right? So you can see the red line, that diagonal, that's still in tension, it's straight and it's taut in that diagonal direction from my nose corner to the opposite diagonal corner. Whereas where the blue lines are, that's in compression and you can see the paper has kind of buckled along that diagonal direction. So using tension and compression, if we wanted to, we could make that diagonal stiffer to be able to take compression and or use the diagonal in the red direction to take tension whenever we're dealing with a cantilever and an end load. And so this is the start of trusses because this is truss behavior. Tension and compression working together diagonally. So let's look at this in more detail. First, a reminder of where we've come from. Remember we did cables that were only in tension, flip that round to be arches only in compression, columns as singular compression elements. And today, for the first time, we're putting these things together. We're putting them together to form a truss, tension and compression working together. And excitingly, the first time we're dealing with spanning a distance greater than the length of the pieces that it's made from, otherwise known as structures. So. As we go through, here's a first example. I'm going to be building up a cantilever for you and then making it a truss that spans a distance. So that's where we're going with these diagrams. So the first diagram here, we've got tension in red, compression in blue, and a weight at the end. This is representing exactly what I showed you with the piece of paper when I pulled down on one side and we saw the direction that the compression was going on the diagonal and here the tension. And in this case, we have a setup where both can exist. Now, this is a structure may look a little weird, so we can change it to sort of something that we're more familiar with seeing, and this sort of makes more sense to most people. There's a weight at the end, we're pulling it um, up using the hand uh, that's in tension, and because we're trying to have it as a cantilever, the uh, hand that's in compression is pushing it out, so allowing it to be further away from the supports. Now, if we go and expand this a bit, and you'll see as I build these diagrams up, the weight stays in the same place, and we're going to expand the cantilever to one side. We're dealing with more structure here by going a further distance. We've introduced this additional compression element and this additional tension element. And we have, again, tension and compression on the diagonals. They're balancing each other out and in terms of their horizontal load, and they contribute to carrying this vertical load through um, to the back of the cantilever. If we go again, we end up in an interesting scenario where, you have to trust me on this, but this is physics, the tension in this diagonal and in this diagonal are the same. Why? Because essentially the weight, that vertical weight as it moves across the cantilever stays the same, right? But this blue compression here is darker than this blue here, because as we go further back in the length and span of the cantilever, the compression along this base is going to increase because something has to do more work as we do a greater distance. And back further still, these two red diagonals are the same, these two blue compression diagonals are the same, but as we pull back, we're getting a darker red here than this red, a darker blue than this blue, because that, that's where there's increasing force to manage. Uh, what we're dealing with. Now, um, we normally don't want, on the next image, what I'm going to show you is, is flipping to vertical compressions. Why? Because if I go back to this, we don't always want longer compression members. Remember, we dealt with this in the columns video I showed you, where the length of a compression member matters quite a lot. So we can shift some of this around in this way to make those compression elements as short as they can be, basically going straight from top to bottom and leaving the uh, diagonals in tension. 
that's generally a good idea when you're dealing with any mix of tension and compression elements. And now what I'm going to do is flip this around. I'm going to mirror this, which is going to look a little odd, but there we go. This on, on this side that I'm showing you was the same as I showed you before. Its mirror is over on the other side. And we have here a sort of weird seesaw structure, right? It, um, but it, it's following the logic of what I showed you before. We've got weights on either end and a support in the middle. I'm showing this to you because now we're going to flip the weights to supports and the support to a weight. So all tension and compression is going to reverse, but all geometry otherwise is going to stay the same. So watch this. There we go, right? I'll go back. See that? The reds and the blues are going to switch. Now I've got supports at either end. So we've got the weight in the middle now being carried back with compression diagonals, because that's reversed from before, and we've got the verticals in the middle between as carrying tension. And remember, this is what I showed once before. We're now going to try and measure the weight of the structure itself. It's a measure of material efficiency, given how we're choosing to lay out our structural members that make our whole structure. Right? That gets to be our choice if we understand the behavior. So let's make that switch that we did before, now that we have this spanning truss. That's really what we have here, right? This, this moment of a spanning truss. So we're going to make those uh, compression members vertical only, so that they're shorter, and we're going to have the diagonals in tension. And now what we're seeing is something that it's, we've got a more efficient structure, it's lighter as a structural weight in terms of the usage of material. And you may remember um, this image from the very uh, first sort of cables video I did. So what I want you to see is that just we're building up these pieces because that's how they behave and they don't change their behavior just as we start adding them and making them work with other types of structural uh, items. So the V shape that you're seeing in the truss makes sense. Essentially you could almost see this outer ones as being part of a broader V as well because that's how cables want to behave, right? So, and we've got a series of kind of columns propping apart the top and the bottom. We also have compression along the top and tension along the bottom. Right? So if we now look at a bridge example of this, and I like this one because it's, it's a very simple bridge, but it clearly shows what's going on in terms of member sizes, right? We've got tensions on the, tension on the two diagonals, as I'm showing here, and the vertical members, which are as short as they can be, those are in compression, which is why they're a little chunkier than the tension rods that you're seeing here. We can see this again in a, a longer span bridge. Um, even though it's a photograph on the skew, now that we know how things are behaving, we're going, right, okay, here's my tension diagonal as part of a broader V, and here's my compression vertical, and that makes sense because the compression vertical is I will call it chunkier, but it's chunky in terms of, remember, how we distribute area. It doesn't have to be solid, just like I showed in the column video, but it's broader. And there's a lot of members lacing it together to provide overall stability to the compression and prevent it buckling. So back we go to our um, typically very efficient spanning truss, right? Like we've saved material weight from what I, I first showed you. How about we try and make these compression members shorter still by sort of bracing them off, what's going to be called a K-truss. Now, that sort of did some things. It's a little weird. A bunch of the um, forces started to go in different directions. And in fact, if I go back and forth, you'll see that didn't really help us as much as we might have hoped it would, um, given we, we had a good thought and sort of wanted to implement it. But as with many things, and you have to try something new to get ahead, so let's consider this one step forward before going two steps ahead, which is that we're thinking about a better placement of some of these nodes to allow for a reduction in the length of all the compression members and an increase in length for all the tension members. If we could somehow maximize that for tension, minimize for compression, then, then we would be getting to a more efficient structure. And what that ends up being, if you actually study that, is this form. This is an optimized truss, right? We've now moved some of these a little bit into different locations than they were before, 
But you'll start to see, not only does it sort of look quite beautiful, but also quite natural, which is maybe why we think it looks beautiful in terms of what we're used to seeing. But what we've also got here, you might start to appreciate, is what looks like a series of arches, right? Overall going compression, and a series of hanging cables going through it, right? Like we've, we've essentially taken ourselves out of a more rectilinear um, land and way of thinking and expanded it. I will counter this with the note that you see there's no more sort of triangles in this section. This is a very optimized truss because it's optimized for this load in this location. It would not be optimized if this load moved around or there were lots of different loads, right? So when you have a limited situation or something that you can control, you're more able to optimize for it. But even so, this gives us the minimum weight truss in a way that is tension and compression working together with pieces that are smaller than the eventual span that they create to provide a very efficient and beautiful structure. And that's trusses.